Good evening. Welcome to the Newsmaker Series. Janet Vestal Kelly is former Virginia Secretary of State and currently the Principal and Director of Government Relations for America's Kids Belong, an organization whose goal is to unite government, faith-based, business, and creative communities to end the foster care and adoption crisis in the United States. She was named Secretary of State by the Governor uh, Bob McDonnell after his inauguration and assumed the position in 2010, lasting until 2014. Janet and her husband Ryan's political path and personal adoption story led them to launch a campaign with the Governor called Virginia Adopts, a collaborative approach to match over 1,000 children with permanent families in just one year. Please join me in welcoming Janet to Patrick Henry College. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming up from Richmond. You're very welcome. And just one quick politics question, then we'll move to, to foster care and adoption. Uh, you, you, were, you were, how are we doing? You were Secretary of State, uh, and, and you were just saying that, that it was a good experience, but you are happy not to be Secretary of State right now. Tell, could you tell us very briefly about the experience for for kids who are thinking about politics and getting involved in a little bit, but maybe getting involved too. Do we need to pause and get our audio? I think we may. Out? Okay. Yeah, we're doing all right. Okay. Let's try it. Why don't you? So, great question. I, I did enjoy um, being Secretary of State, and of course in Virginia, because if any Virginia friends see this or read about this, and I don't say that it was actually Secretary of the Commonwealth, I will never be invited back into state government. So, Virginia is technically a Commonwealth. There are four um, across the country, and Virginia is one of those, and obviously it dates back to our Great Britain days, uh, pre-United States. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, obviously, any time you're part of a governor's cabinet, it is such an honor to serve. And um, that office especially is an amazing office. It does a restoration of voting rights for felons who are uh, trying to acclimate back into society. Um, lobbyist disclosures, um, 4,000 board and commission, volunteer board and commission appointments. So I got to meet 4,000 of some of the greatest civic-minded Virginians that we have. And so obviously, that was great. I will say that even since I've left state government three years ago, the, um, the civility uh, factor has changed quite a bit. So I'm very, very grateful that I get to work with foster care and adoption now instead of being uh, in the line of fire, so to speak, in politics. Okay, then let's talk about foster care and adoption. Let's see. Okay. I think this will work. If not, we'll do something. Can you hear me or not? This is not working? Okay. I'll just speak up a little bit. Uh, now it's working. Okay, great. Uh, how did you become interested in foster care and adoption? Well, you know, it's funny. I remember the very first time I met the first foster family. Um, and uh, I was on a mission trip. It was 2007 to New Orleans. Uh, this lady, her, present, her husband was president of a, a large company in Virginia. And she was telling me about herself. And um, she said, oh, we're, we're a foster family. And I thought to myself, why would anyone do that? That was my reaction. Okay. And so I've done obviously a complete 180. Um, I met a, a woman on the sidewalk at a mall in 2010, right after I became Secretary of the Commonwealth. And um, she gave me my education on poverty and on, uh, uh, on birth families that need support and need help. And we did support her and help her for two years. And then unfortunately, um, circumstances took a turn and we ended up with uh, the child that she was pregnant with two years earlier when I met her on the sidewalk at the mall. And that's how my attention turned toward this issue. Um, besides my personal story, my pastor has also been pivotal in making sure that he talks about this from the pulpit to the point of having a rally in our town um, with hundreds of people to talk about the fact that there are at the time, there were 3,000 kids in the foster care system, 1,000 of whom were waiting to be adopted. And so between my personal experience and my pastor, uh, God got my attention on this issue for sure. Okay, so tell us about that personal experience with that child. How did that work out? 
Um, well, she uh, was lost and needed help and heading to Planned Parenthood to confirm her pregnancy and asked me if I could take her. And I just said, oh, you have met the last person on the planet that's going to be able to take you there, but what do you need? And she just said, look, I just need a pregnancy test today to confirm that I'm pregnant so that I can get benefits if I am. I said, okay, I can help you with that. So uh, I directed her to a crisis pregnancy center that was a stone's throw from where we were standing. And um, as they say, that the, the, the rest is sort of history. It, um, we became friends and um, she ended up keeping the baby. Um, and uh, again, we befriended her. She started coming to our church. Uh, two years later, again, they relapsed. And um, we got a call uh, nine days after our wedding that he was going to go into foster care if we didn't take him. And we just knew. There were too many coincidences uh, leading up to that day and leading up to that call. And we knew that this was something that we needed to do. So my husband became a who was 38-year-old bachelor, became a husband, stepdad. I uh, had a, a six-year-old at the time. Uh, a foster dad and a bio dad. We found out we were expecting the next day, all within about 21 days in 2012. So talk about a 180 from politics into this issue. I, I took it. So tell us about your family right now. Sure. It's lovely. Um, my husband's a saint. Uh, Reagan, my oldest, is 13. Uh, Ashton's six. Tobin is four. Um, they all have very distinct sort of, uh, if you follow birth order theory, all di very distinct firstborn characteristics, which you can imagine what that's like in our house. They all think they're in charge, which is fun. Um, and uh, we have, um, we don't think about the fact that Ashton's adopted very often. Um, he looks like us, he acts like us, so he fits right in. And um, we've got a great relationship with the birth family. We try to keep in touch with them um, several times a year. And... Um, you know, every day is not perfect, but we have a great life. Right. So good. Um, 400,000 kids in foster care across the United States, right? About 26,800 every year. Not a happy situation. The, what, is, is anyone doing something in some states to try to make that better? So the short answer is yes, and um, there are many wonderful organizations. Um, if you've eaten at a Wendy's, you've probably helped to support this movement. Um, they have started something called Wendy's Wonderful Kids, where they really focus on kids who are getting ready to age out of foster care. Um, the, sh the, the, the longer answer, though, is that... The longer answer, though, is that... Um, there really is not a strategic state-by-state -state approach to ending the foster care crisis in the United States, or at least there wasn't, and I like to believe, until America's Kids Belong was founded two years ago. And that's really what our desire is, um, to introduce some strategy into each state. Of course, the national strategy doesn't work because this is a state issue, so we have to go state by state by state. Scaling is an interesting prospect with us, of course, but we've been in Oklahoma and Tennessee getting ready to go into some other states, Virginia being one of those. Even though we started here and this was the foundation of it, um, we're getting ready to come back in. And as you know, we, um, we started off um, in Colorado about 10 years ago um, our co-founders, uh, a couple named the Mavises in Colorado, started out making high-quality pictures and videos of children who were waiting to be adopted and showed them in churches. So they had sort of the creative and faith spheres. And then in Virginia, 10 years later, um, we ran a program in utilizing the government and business spheres and also working with nonprofits. So now we've combined all of those spheres. We've got faith, the creative sphere, business, government, and nonprofits. And we operate on a model called the collective impact model, which says instead of all these five spheres and people in these spheres kind of rowing around each other in a lake, we build a bigger boat and we ask everyone to jump in and row toward the same goal at the same time. And um, we've just found that it's not only common sense and it's backed up by science. Um, the Stanford University has sort of proven this model works and that's why we, that's how we operate. And um, we really are seeing some pretty significant changes pretty quickly in these states that we're in. So when you say it works, what's the definition of working? Well, that's a great question. Um, we have found that more quality foster families are the single, the biggest domino that make all the other dominoes fall. So whether it's retention, whether it's um, child welfare workers keeping their jobs and staying and staying happy in their jobs, whether it's um, birth families having a greater chance at reunification, 
whether it's more children being adopted, all of those key performance indicators, having quality foster families is the number one indicator that all of those things are going to get better. And so that's really our focus. We work with the, the state that has the kids, and we go into churches who have families, and we try to get them to work together in the best interests of those kids and, um, and, and find those quality foster families. And in Oklahoma, the very first month out of the gate, we saw a 109% increase in the number of foster families that received a placement, not that expressed interest or made it through training, but actually did all of that and had a child placed in their home. And for government work, you know, when you're used to 5 and 10% increases being exceptional, 109% increases, we were extremely pleased and obviously um, would give credit um, not to ourselves, but to God in that, because he, this is a movement that we're a part of, that he's already started, and lots of other great organizations across the country are also um, leading the way, even before we did. The, the definition of working, though, is what? Getting more kids out of foster care, getting them adopted, getting them to tell, tell us so about So I wasn't specific you're... enough about that. Right. So once you get enough foster families, our goal and the way we will know if we were successful is that we have changed who waits. And by that, I mean when we have more families waiting to foster and adopt, then there are children waiting to be fostered or adopted. We'll consider that a success. And that will obviously have to be a state-by-state -state dynamic. So the way that families have tended to be recruited in the past is, yes, they, they believe they have the, um, the bandwidth to do a good job, but here we're going to pay them a certain amount of money and attract them in that way, which it's difficult to know exactly how much money to offer, whether too much and get people who are in it for the money or too little and they can't survive. Uh, you're looking for a different type of qualification right now, it sounds like. Uh, what, what makes for a quality foster care situation? So I would say a quality foster family is one that has the room, um, who doesn't necessarily need the money. You know, if, if foster families, and I think that that's mostly a myth, of course there are families who are motivated, motivated by the money, but the foster families that we've encountered um, are really just looking to recuperate their costs. Um, and then lastly, that they're, they're trauma-informed which means they understand that kids who um, come from hard places aren't, their brains are physiologically different than children who grew up attached to a loving parent. Um, I'd say those three are sort of the basics. And then beyond that, of course, you know, having good siblings and, um, and a great family life, of course, those givens are there. But those are the three basics, I'd say. So with kids who have been through lots of trauma, what kind of support services are needed to help those families do a good job? So every locality is different. Depending on where you live and depending the state that you're in, um, you're going to get different support and different services. Um, but then my personal preference is toward a curriculum based out of Texas, Dr. Karen Purvis. We went through a secular adoption agency, and she was in our videos. That just tells you the quality of her work. I mean, she's amazing. She just passed away recently. Um, but her work is called TBRI, Trust-Based Relational Intervention. And it is um, essentially uh, the mechanics of attachment therapy and how important it is and how um, physiological changes and neurological changes happen when you are able to look at that child as a kid who's not bad, but a kid who's sad when you're able to look past the behavior to the need. And again, this is different in every child, and it's certainly different in ch children who have been from hard places. That's the number one curriculum that I've seen. They have a conference every year called Empowered to Connect. There are 400 simulcasts all over the country, and I would encourage anyone, um, I don't care how far you have to drive, if you're fostering or if you've adopted or if you're encountering a child from a hard place, it is a must-see and a must-do. So how do you uh, walk the fine line of encouraging foster care uh, and also encouraging adoption, while at the same time warning parents that it's going to be very hard with kids who have been traumatized. Uh, how do you get the right, the right mix of, of uh, excitement and enthusiasm, but also legitimate wariness and preparation? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so one of the things we do when we go into churches, um, we encourage the senior pastors to talk about foster care and adoption as a first step. 
And you'd be surprised how many haven't, even though the scriptures are pretty clear on how we should take care of orphans. Lots of pastors feel like if they haven't personally fostered or adopted, that they shouldn't be talking about it from the pulpit. And of course, you know, there are tons of areas of scripture that they talk about and they don't have personal experience about. Um, but we really, the first entree into this issue, we, we sort of soften people's hearts. And then we encourage them um, within a couple of weeks to have um, sort of a come to Jesus on how difficult it is. And um, at the same time, it's sort of like marriage. If you know how hard it's going to be before you start, no one would do it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really a, a personal sort of spiritual journey that you just have to experience for yourself. Um, we do encourage the church to wrap around both birth families and foster and adoptive families and ensure that they do have the support. A lack of social support is the number one reason why foster parents burn out. And so we would never go into a church and say, everyone in this church should foster or adopt. That That's not... It's not feasible, it's not realistic, it's not logical. Um, we would encourage one family from every small group and have the rest of that small group wrap around them. Um, that is how, that's how, that's our approach. That's the approach of successful models from Sandra Stanley down in North Point in Atlanta um, to Saddleback to all the folks that are doing it right. Um, they would say that that wraparound support is, is absolutely crucial. One more point on the difference between fostering and adopting. Adoption has a great brand, right? You hear the word adoption and you just think, oh, that's lovely. Foster care doesn't yet. And that is, that is uh, one of the, the goals of our organization is to recognize that in the scriptures, fostering and that reconciliation with the birth family is probably at a higher level of importance than even adopting. If you look at the, the, the theme of scripture and the narrative of reconciliation and redemption in scripture, I mean, we, we couldn't be higher on fostering. And, uh, you know, a lot of parents think, oh, I just couldn't do that. I just couldn't take a child into my home and then let them go to a birth family that I don't know if they're going to take care of them again. And those are the families we say that's exactly why you should foster. If you're going to love a kid that much that your heart gets broken, that tells me that you're doing it for the right reasons. And, and so it is hard. Um, we do warn parents that it's hard. Our own situation was difficult. Um, but just like marriage, just like all the good things in life, those sacrifices are worth it. So could you give us an example of a, of a church that has done it really well? As you say, maybe starting out with one family and then growing from there. Oh, because, because in a way, when you, when you say, well, there's a 109% increase, that's great. On the other hand, it's a little scary because there are probably some people who get wrapped up in the enthusiasm who perhaps should not be doing it. So if you could give an example of a, of a church that step-by-step step has grown a really well-thought-out program, that would be helpful. So there are, there are many, and I hesitate to even list these, and I hope you'll give me editorial review when I go back and list some more if I forget any off the top of my head. Um, but in Oklahoma, I would say that uh, Life Church um, has started working on this issue. They have 100,000 people come on Mother's Day last year. And uh, they had 3,000 families sign up for the second wave informational night. And then uh, about 300 families sign up to actually foster. So you can now, Let me ask, they had, they had 100,000 people come to what exactly? Their church service on a Sunday morning. So Mother's Day... Um, uh, 100,000? They have so many campuses. Isn't okay. that crazy? All right. um, they've, got 20, they've got dozens of campuses across Oklahoma, and they're actually in other states now. Um, 100,000 attendants um, heard the message... 3,000 people showed up at those individual campuses total uh, across Oklahoma, and then we had about 300 sign up. But So those 300 signed up to foster, but the other 2,700, or part of those 2,700, wrapped around the ones that did sign up to foster, so it was beautiful. So that's one. Um, Church of the City in Franklin, Tennessee, has done some amazing work around this issue. They started um, a wraparound ministry. Sandra Stanley in North Point is probably the leader um, historically on this issue. Been doing this for years and years and years. Um, but there are Clover Hill Assembly of God in Chesterfield, Virginia. Um, those are the four off the top of my head. But there are hundreds, literally hundreds of churches across the country who are active on this issue. Okay, so let's let's just dive into several of these. Uh, the, the Franklin, Tennessee, for example, and I'm thinking of that particularly because uh, tomorrow afternoon, George Grant uh, is, is going to be interviewed here, and he's, uh, uh, he's been a pastor for, for years there. So I'm just curious. Uh, tell, tell us about how that worked. 
So in April of last year, the senior pastor had our president and his wife, who started the videos in Colorado, and our Tennessee state director on the stage for a service, mm -hmm. just like this. And we told the story about the, the videos and how we got started. They showed videos of waiting kids. Um, Brian, our founder, uh, co-founder, um, he, he allowed Brian to take over his pulpit to speak about this issue, which is pastors are reluctant rare, to do that. Yeah. as you know. And um, they had uh, several hundred people at their, they have a church, the church is about 2,000 people. They had several hundred people at their informational night, the second wave that we do. And uh, in the midst of all this, they're starting a wraparound ministry. So when a foster family does sign up to go forward, they're supported oh, do you need me to babysit your, your, your birth kid so that you can take your child to counseling? Do you need, oh, your car needs to be fixed? Let me take that and get the oil changed for you. Let me take care of meals for a month for you. I'll start a meal train. That's what we mean by wrapping around, just to be clear. You would think it's common sense, but um, not always. So um, then they uh, showed four videos of waiting children on a few months later on Christmas Eve, and each of those kids was placed in a family. Um, so that's the that's Church of the City in Franklin and how they've done things. Um, their pastor's wife, uh, Brandy Whitehead, is a um, former social worker, so she gets it. God's given her a burden for especially single moms, and so um, she and, and Darren, the pastor, have just really taken a leadership role in Tennessee and, and made sure that other pastors know about this issue and are doing things on it. Okay, tell us about North Point. So North Point, we're not technically in Georgia. So again, editorial, I, I may send you some stuff afterwards, but Sandra Stanley, and you'll notice a common trend here, Dr. Olasky, it's the wives who are leading on this issue, um, which is interesting. Uh, most of the time, the wives are out front saying, come on, come on, come on, let's do this. And the husband is saying, whoa, I don't get enough of you as it is. How are we going to bring another kid into our home? And so, you know, as a woman, um, I definitely wouldn't describe myself as a feminist, but it is interesting to watch that dynamic. And so Sandra Stanley um, started uh, a very similar to our wraparound model um, and uh, 10 years ago in, in uh, Atlanta, right outside, of, right outside of Atlanta, and they've been partnering with the state. If I'm not mistaken, they actually do training. They do foster parent training. Um, I mean, they, they've jumped in, not just with, with both feet, they are, they're, they're up to their neck in this. Um, and it is just there in the community, North Point is known for caring about kids and specifically caring about foster kids. So now when you say partnering with the state, that would send some evangelicals who would, they would have the heebie-jeebies about that, basically. Uh, you know, because there are all these, all these very sad, sometimes tragic stories about people very well-attentioned who get into this. Uh, there's a problem. They ask the state for help, and then the state comes and really messes with the whole family. I mean, both, both the foster care children and the, and the, the birth children. Uh, so there's a lot of fear out there. Uh, how do you deal with that? And, and what, what have you seen? Oh, man, that's a tough one. So part of our model as well is going in, and I completely, it's easy for me to say, because I was from the government side, what is there to be worried about? But of course, I've heard these stories too. And it is scary. Um, I will say just um, thematically, I think that foster care is probably the number one issue where you can follow the most of Jesus's important commandments at the same time, all at the same time. Love your neighbor and don't be afraid, right? Um, and so, of course, it's easy for me to sit here and say, don't be afraid. Um, but dealing with the government is part of this equation, and it shouldn't be a barrier to loving your neighbor well. Um, I will say the, the social workers, just to give them a little grace on this, 99% of them are underpaid, overworked. They see more things in a day trauma-wise than I see my entire life. I couldn't do what they do. Mm -hmm, right. um, they have, it's called vicarious trauma, things that they see that um, I'm not sure that our, as a culture we have done a great job at recognizing that and dealing with that. And so we do encourage a culture of grace when dealing with social workers. Um, because the lament often from social workers is, I went into this field to help people, and as it is, I am 
mostly shuffling paper Absolutely. and sort of being a police person. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, that's not why I, why I wanted to do this. Absolutely. And they see, you know, they, they read the Bible, they see what it says and they're like, where's the church? Where, where's the church? I mean, we've heard, we've walked into rooms and the social workers have said, we have been trying to meet with pastors my entire career. And this is the first time. And you're not even from this state. This is the first time we've ever talked to someone from the faith community. Shame on us as a church, right? And so we view the social workers as part of this ministry. We're not technically a faith-based organization, um, but we do include them in the way we approach the, 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 the foster care system. They're our first line of defense. So um, I, I love when I hear about churches that, and our, my church does this, care packages for social workers. Step one, before you even go to talk about the kids, go to the director of DSS, show up, just say, I'm here to help, what can I do? And don't get discouraged when you don't get an answer. Just show up and keep, bring cookies, bring donuts, bring a thank you note, send a letter, whatever it is you need to do to let them know that you're selfless in this, you're not going away. Um, there is a model out of South Carolina, I'll try to get you the, um, the information on it, that uh, that deal specifically with how to minister to social workers, but it it is a very I, I wouldn't I won't say it's an irrational fear, but it's not one that should let you stop that should stop you from getting involved in this issue. Now, what happens when there's a Christian foster care family, and they uh, are used to praying at meals, praying with children, going to church, and so forth? Uh, are there obstacles? What, what, what obstacles have you seen with families like that as far as the state is concerned? It depends on the state, of course. Um, I won't name any states by name. Um, but give, but... Give, us a, give us your, your worst case example and the best case example. You know, we work mostly in southern states so far. So I honestly have not heard, I mean, we're in the Bible Belt. Right. So we have not encountered a scenario yet where I would say, wow, that's really tough. The toughest cases that we've heard of are um, where a Christian family will, uh, they will get a, um, a transgendered child placed in their family or ask, would you take a transgender child? Those kinds of situations are more the, the, the ones that we've seen. And, you know, I got to tell you, I'm so impressed with these families because most of the ones we've heard of just say, bring it on. Let's go. Let's do this. And, um, you know, they, they look at the scriptures and they, they say, I'm going to love my neighbor. And, and it doesn't matter what that neighbor looks like or acts like. I'm going to love him anyway. And, um, you know, we, it, it's not easy and it's not for everyone. But we've heard some great stories out there so far. So tell, tell us a story when there were real problems. And then how did, how did the local church deal with that? How did the state authorities deal with that? How did your organization perhaps come alongside people? What, what do you do when there is a big problem? Let me think of an example here. We had, um, we had a scenario where uh, a foster family got through the... Um, training, signed up, felt like it was something that they should do, um, signed up, um, had several children uh, placed in their home. One of them, uh, they started out as respite care parents. So um, respite care is when you uh, take a child for a weekend and give a foster family uh, or an adoptive family a break. And it became very clear to this family that the foster family was accusing the child of having special needs, ADHD, just to get on medication because the foster family would make more money. And um, because when the child was at her house that was orderly and stable and um, relatively quiet, as quiet as you can be with boys in the family, right. uh, he was fine. I mean, absolutely fine. And uh, she went to the social worker and said, this is happening, and I'm really concerned about it. And the social worker just laughed and said, it happens all the time. If we, if we took kids off medication every time they were with a stable family, 
because the respite care family is more stable than the foster care family, that's all I would do is be filling out, again, filling out paperwork and changing medication, and that's just not realistic. And so, you know, again, uh, why is the serpents and harmless as doves? It, you, I don't think that anything really changed. That child um, has since been placed in a, a different family and is on the path to adoption. I hope he's okay. I don't know that he is. Um, she got another child and just very quickly realized that the um, short-term fostering was not for her. It just wasn't something that she could do. And so now she's doing other things. Um, she supported us when we got our son. She was one of the few families in our church who kind of got, we, we had what's called a kinship care placement where you know the family. We didn't get monthly support or really any training. Um, we just got a child. And so as newlywed, she was smart enough to know that maybe we needed a few weekends off and, and took him. And so she was our wraparound support and she did that for us. And so, um, you know, it's really important to note that not everyone is called to foster or adopt, but everyone is called to care. And um, for this friend, um, that's what it looked like to care, um, was just to help us. It, she clearly it just wasn't her thing, but she helped us. Now, there's often, uh, and again, I, I, I think we want to deal, and in, in I appreciate what you're saying, we want to deal realistically with these questions. And so often there's uh, a family that with great intention to start out and then finds uh, themselves to be over their head and drowning, and there's a certain shame that they feel, and they're often, uh, I'm, again, I don't know about often, but you see situations where they really don't want to tell someone because it's, it's an admission they feel a failure on their part. How do you overcome the shame that may lead people to hide problems? Oh, man, that's a great question. I think the first step is making sure that we're communicating ahead of time that just like marriage and just like your own birth children, it is not going to be easy or perfect every second of the day. And just resetting that expectation, and even more so, obviously, in these cases um, with these children. Um, and having part of the, um, the training curriculum, uh, we encourage churches to host the training on site. Think about showing up at a government, several government building. You have to pay your own child care. Um, you're not sure where it is. You're not sure if there's parking versus walking into the comfortable, warm, welcoming environment of a church where you drop your children off every single Sunday and you know the workers and their background checked and everything is safe. So we love scenarios where the church and the state can work together to get the training house at, at the church. Um, and when you do that, what you get is a group of 20 people going through the training together. And then they all get placements together. So you have your own little, in addition to your own wraparound, people that are supporting you, you have those 20 people that is an ad hoc support group for you. And there are also online support groups. I mean, in this day and age, I would certainly hope that the shame of um, admitting that this is hard um, is less of a factor than it used to be because it is hard. I mean, there is no shame in admitting that. And um, there's nothing but um, praise for attempting it. So um, finding people who have been through it um, and, and hopefully walking through with other couples that you already know in this experience can help. So the, the parallel to marriage is interesting because this gets into the theological question that uh, uh, people look upon marriage as a covenantal relationship mm -hmm. and thus... Uh, something that they should not even be thinking about divorce is uh, a an adoption situation like that similar to marriage or do you do you teach about it covenantally or when when can when is it considered okay to break things off oh I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that because I'll probably take a pretty hard line on it okay. um I think that if if you have been walking this path and you feel like this is something that God's called you to do, there are very rare instances where it's okay to disrupt that. Um, and in fact, the child is um, pushing you to reject them again out of their own pain. And by accepting them at their worst, that can be probably the most healing thing that that child's going to experience. So I would take a really hard line on that. Others may not, um, and especially professionals um, uh, that um, 
have um, experience with, you know, sexual abuse, um, violence, and things like that, there are going to be some cases where um, I think anyone would say, okay, you did your best, and it just wasn't meant to be. But I think that those are the rare, 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 rare occasions. Um, disrupted adoptions are, uh, unfortunately, um, a bit of an issue here in the United States, both internationally and domestically. And uh, every time I hear them, it just breaks my heart. I think, too, um, to back up on the preventative side, if you are getting into foster care and adoption for any other reason than a completely selfless love of that child, um, you're setting yourself up for a huge disappointment um, because it is, uh, I like to say it was fast-track sanctification in 2012 when um, all of that stuff was happening. Uh, I think I did more spiritual growth in those few months than I had done my entire life um, because I just had to completely um, forget I, I, I forget about myself. Uh, and that's a good posture when you're going into this. It's not easy, but when you look at what, what Christ did for us and what we're called to lay down our life for, that's the, that's the mode, that's the best entree into this field. This is the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. And so at lunchtime today, I was interviewing Carl Truman, who's an expert uh, historian, hmm. uh, who's an expert on Luther. And so we were talking about Luther's distinction between the theology of glory, which he was very much criti very critical of, as opposed to the theology of the cross. Hmm. Uh, so I suspect you're saying that... The theology of the cross is probably where it's at. Yeah. It's, where, it's where it's at. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, um, I, wh what do you see going around the country with, with so many states right now uh, dominated in the legislatures and the, and the governor's office by by Republicans and conservative Republicans, uh, should this be, should we be doing better than we are? And, and why do you see, I mean, we see Colorado, we see Virginia, uh, you mentioned a couple of others, but a lot of, you, you don't see much action in lots of states, even when there are people who you think would be very committed to this. Uh, why is that? Oh, I wish I knew the answer fully. Uh, I, I think, I can talk about perceptions here because right. politics is, um, in part, uh, based on perceptions. Um, I spoke at my church following the elections uh, on um, the current state of politics, and there's a, um, a guy who works in our governor's office who's a Democrat, and myself, we were the two speakers, and it was a nice yin and yang on stage. And, after, and I, I talked about how um, Republicans do care about people. We just have a different view of who should take care of them. We mm -hmm. don't believe that the government has primary responsibility. We believe the church does. And a lady stopped me afterwards. And my church is non-denominational. We've got a broad swath of, of all different types of folks that come. And she came up to me afterwards and she said, that's the first time I've ever heard a Republican say they care about people. What? What? And so, you know, we've known Republicans kind of have a messaging problem for a while. We've known this. But um, the perception is that Republicans don't care about people. I, will, I, would like to, I would like to think that it's not that they don't care. It's that they don't know. Um, my own governor, uh, when Governor McDonnell in Virginia, he had been an attorney general, governor for two years. He had been in the state legislature for 15 years. I had been in politics for 15 years at that point. I had no idea that there were a thousand children in Virginia's foster care system who were waiting to be adopted until my pastor told me. He had no idea about those children until I told him. And so, um, you know, when we first launched America's Kids Belong, I was on a, the phone with five different child welfare folks from across the country. And I was talking to them about exporting our model from Virginia to other parts of the state. This is before I knew that Brian was starting something a national. And uh, they said, Janet, you know, we, we love what you're trying to do. We really admire your passion. This isn't going to work. I said, why not? And they said, this doesn't get them on the front page of the newspaper. It doesn't get them off the front page of the newspaper. It's not going to work. And I just said, I completely disagree with you, and I'm going to spend the next 10 years of my life proving you wrong. And I will say that every Republican governor that I have spoken with, which is over a dozen at this point about this program, um, even if they haven't signed on right away and, and done it right away, we don't have the bandwidth to do a dozen states at one time. They have all said, we have to do something about this. Secondly, really quickly, 
um, from a political perspective. You know, you've got Democrats who stereotypically talk, care about kids, and really simplistically, you have Republicans who stereotypically care about money. Either way, we win on this issue. Both of those things, it's a heart issue and a smart issue. It costs, as you said, it costs $25,000 to keep a kid in foster care. It costs $30,000 to keep a kid in prison, which is where they're going if we don't find them a home. Um, it costs $300,000 over their lifetime uh, for, in social welfare, welfare costs for, for kids who we don't find a family for. And so it is absolutely the smart thing to do. Even if you have no heart, it's the smart government thing to do. But of course, we know, um, you know, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've talked to my mom since I turned 18, or I can't imagine living my, my life without them. And so obviously the heart issue is self-evident as well. And so uh, kids who age out of the foster care system at 18, the statistics are pretty gruesome about what happens to them as far as drug use, prison, and so forth. Uh, what, what, do you see any models of states that are particularly working with older kids to make sure that, as best they can, that at age 18, they'll actually have a family? Um, yes. I will say that um, you asked me earlier what success looked like, and I should have said, when there are no children aging out. The whole aging out phenomenon is probably the thing to the extent that there is an injustice issue in this world that just breaks my heart and motivates me to get out of bed every morning, that's it. Um, when there are no children aging out of the foster care system in America, that's when I can rest a little bit easier. Um, Youth Villages in Tennessee um, is doing good work. Um, I'll let you look them up, they do great work. Okay. Uh, there's a program in Virginia called Great Expectations that provides mentors and coaches with uh, children who are going through the community college system, which they get to go to for free because they're foster children. There are probably other models I can research for you, um, but I tell every single one of those organizations when we encounter them, I wanna put you out of business. I don't, I love what you're doing, but I hate that you have to exist. And they say, we completely agree with you. We're, we're not doing these kids a service if they get to us and they don't have a family. Children belong in families, period. The church believes that. Um, Annie E. Casey is a wonderful, not faith-based organization who's done all sorts of research about this. They spent tons of money researching best indicators for kids. Guess what they found out? Kids belong in families. Yeah. Questions from any of you? Hi, thank you very much for being here and for what you're doing for God's children. Thank uh, you. Beautiful. Um, it's an historic day in that uh, the beginning of a Senate uh, judiciary hearing for a Supreme Court justice. Um, should Roe v. Wade be overturned, and there were 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 more children per year coming into a need for foster care and adoptive care, what does the church and society need to do to be ready? Look, I think it would be great if another abortion never happened. Obviously, I'm about as pro-life as they come. Today, if that happened, the church and our country are entirely unprepared for that, as you mentioned. Um, all these children who would be coming into hard situations. Um, you know, I have some friends who have done foster care and adoption, and they literally tell me, Janet, if I hear one more thing from a church-going Christian about bring, being pro-life, and they haven't either fostered or adopted or done something to support that movement, I can't even talk to them. Um, these are Christians and non-Christians. And so I think um, the church is at a really great crossroads. I think that we're having an existential crisis in some ways, which you could flip that around and say it's an existential opportunity um, to practice what we preach, to walk the walk, um, instead of just talking the talk. I grew up going to pro-life marches. I grew up, you know, going to, um, and I went to Liberty University and Regent University. Those are two of the pinnacle of the, before, this was before Patrick Henry was here. Um, but we've missed something along the way, and I do think that there is something to the criticism that comes from both within and without the church, outside the church, that we're pro-life but not pro-birth. So that would be my challenge. If you're pro-life, 
do something. Shame on us that there are kids aging out of the foster care system. Shame on us that there's a shortage of foster families. If one church took one child or fostered a child, this crisis would be over tomorrow. Um, and instead, we're, you know, we're buying really great houses and really nice cars and have really nice looking clothes and we're missing it. We're missing the blessing. We're missing the point. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, that's my heart. I, can, I feel strongly about that. Can you tell? You've talked a little bit about the role of government and the role of nonprofits. Can you lay that out, what you think government needs to do and what you think the other mediating structures need to do? That's a great question. I think that the number one thing that the government can do to solve this crisis is to work with the church. Um, there are more people in church on a Sunday than fill um, Pro Bowl stadiums. Uh, the church is the only institution that is equipped to solve this issue. It's the only institution that's equipped to solve a lot of different issues as well, by the way. Um, and so if, if I had a, an audience with child welfare directors across the country, that's what I would say. Just give us a chance. We're sorry we haven't been here sooner. We're sorry we've let you do this too long by yourselves. Um, we recognize that you're tired, that you're overworked, that you're underpaid, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we want to help, and we're not going anywhere. They think that we're going to show up for five minutes and then leave, and we have to prove them wrong. Even when it gets hard, we're going to be here, which means equipping yourself, which means educating yourself, which means making sure that you know what to do, like Dr. Olasky said, when it gets hard. Um, but that's the number one thing. And of course, I'm biased, but I've seen it work. Um, it's not a simple math equation of the church has the families and the, the state has the kids. It's not that simple, um, but it's pretty simple. Um, and and if, they would, if they would give us a chance and if the church would stick in it when it's hard, that, that's the number one thing that the state could do. As far as nonprofits go, I would say uh, using that collective impact model that I talked about where um, there is some strategic thinking um, there is some um, recognition that duplication and competing, competing and territorialism don't really work, um, but coordinating and collaborating um, and planning together do. Uh, that's, that, that's what I would say to nonprofits and um, actively looking for best practices and employing those. Same potatoes, different gravy. You know, every state's going to have some things that are the same and every state's going to have some, state, some things that are different. Um, but looking for those best practices and, and being, having the humility to recognize you don't have all the answers and that those practices might work is probably the other thing I'd say. Since your efforts began in Virginia, how many children actually have been, uh, have been placed for adoption who were in foster care? The 2013 program was when I was in government. And of course, we left in 2014, so we had one year. And um, the governor stood up and said, we're going to find 1,000 families. And I remember calling... Um, all the reporters who came that day and said, this is aspirational. There's no way we're going to hit this goal. We have six months left in office. Even under the best circumstances, this would take a miracle. Um, 1,041 families came forward and were matched with a waiting child. Um, we used the power of social media. We used the convening power of the governor's office. Um, we used his bully pulpit. And um, we had uh, over a million social media impressions on one of our social media campaigns. I mean, people just came out of the woodwork. So there was a miracle. We couldn't do it on our own. Okay, so three years now, uh, and are you able to keep good records of what happens to those kids, and what are you, what are you finding so far? It's, three years is still early, but when you've had this sudden big change, uh, frankly, how is it working? Oh, that's a great question. The short answer is we don't know, which is painful for me, as you might imagine. I have a very high need for data, but when a new governor comes in, it's their show, and there's, um, they, they've been great. He named an adoption champion, but it was definitely sort of McDonald's thing, and, and he had other priorities. Um, so we, the short answer is we don't know. Um, the long answer is since we left office, there's been a 70% increase in the number of foster children in Virginia because of the opioid crisis. And so we're all of the work we did in 2013 has to be done all over again, but better in a more sustainable way. We didn't involve the church. We didn't have time, really. Um, uh, and, and so going back in, we're looking at this to, as a three- to five-year effort um, that we want to launch this year in Virginia. And are people keeping statistics in Colorado? 
And what are they finding? They have maintained, so they focused on, um, on adoptive, adopted children who were waiting to be adopted. And so they started with 800 kids and they reduced that number to in the 200s and they've maintained that number over the last few years. So their numbers are not going back up. Uh, now, Catholic Charities, I believe in Chicago and also in Boston, had to close down oh. because they did not want to uh, be required to place kids for adoption with, with gay parents. I did not know that. So that's, I, I think that's accurate as far as I know. And to, uh, but that, that this, this was several years ago and I haven't heard of situations like that in the past several years. But uh, how do you approach that question? In other words, if there is a Christian organization that does not want to place children with same-sex couples, uh, at least in Chicago and Boston, they were told, well, either you do it or we can't work with you at all, the government people saying this. And facing that pressure, they said, well, we're just not going to do it. What would you advise Christian organizations to do in situations like that? Man, that's a tough one. Um, that's why I'm asking. As you might imagine, I'm a huge fan of religious liberty and um, really um, value the role of conscience in uh, an individual's life. Um, on the flip side of that, I think that the Supreme Court gay marriage decision sort of um, rendered that null and you either are you're still in the business or you're not because of that Supreme Court decision. And so we, when we go into to states, we tell them that we work with whatever the existing state law is, um, which now, as you know, um, same-sex couples can adopt, single people can adopt, cohabitating couples can adopt. Um, and, um, you know, it is tough. I would just say, church, if, you, if this is your thing, if you don't want children to be placed in um, a gay marriage family, then step up, go get in line, um, because the line isn't that long. You're not going to have to wait that long. You mentioned earlier uh, uh, transgender uh, children or children going through transition. And I'm sure you're aware there's, there's uh, lots of stuff coming out now that essentially uh, what, a, what a cruel thing it is to, uh, with social pressures and then perhaps parents saying, well, this is, what, this is what people are doing, this is what the child wants. Uh, as, as a number of researchers have found, children who have gone through this uh, tend to very rarely improve their psychological state. It often becomes much worse, and they're making a lifetime choice at a very, very young age. In a situation like that, uh, what would you, and, and, and let's say Christian parents who, who see that this is not a solution, what should they do in that situation? Man, Dr. Olasky, you're asking me all the hard questions here at the end. Well, you're going you're gonna to get them. I know. Um, you know, obviously, my personal bias is, is that uh, I didn't know who I was until I was in my 30s. So, <laughs> you know, the longer you can give someone to figure it out, the better. Sure. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I'm not an expert. Um, and I just think, you know, there are some parents that are going to be able to handle that dynamic and work with that child and love that child. And there are some parents that just aren't. And, um, you've got to be able to kind of lay down again, lay down yourself and your preferences at the door and, and work with that child in its, in his or her best interests. And that's really tough when you have strong personal opinions about those kinds of things as, as you and I do, um, and uh, I'm not sure that I have a great answer for that. I would just say that um, you know you're 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 going to have to figure out a way to love that child through that through that process. And there are a lot of kids that are struggling. There are kids yeah. right now that are waiting, and the reason they're not getting adopted is because they're gay or because they're transgender. And you know, I, I guess I would just say, is that child better off in a family that loves them and accepts them, um, or at least will um, will work with them, or are they better kind of out on their own? And man, I just have to err on the side of love on that one. Now, do you, do you personally uh, get involved in, in, uh, in recruiting families, or are you more involved on the, on the macro side of trying to change opinions? We are not a child-placing agency. Okay. So when we go into a state, we don't compete for the fish that are in that lake that we talked about. Mm -hmm. um, we put uh, more fish in the lake. We, we build a bigger lake uh, and a bigger boat. 
So um, we're sort of a business to business macro level. Um, I hate to use the word movement because it's hard to measure, but we're, we're at a 30,000 foot, 15,000 foot level, not on the ground. Okay. Um, what are you finding, and maybe this is too specific a question, um, if people read this interview in World Magazine and they're thinking about doing this, uh, what are you finding as far as, let's say, the, the questions of birth order? Uh, would you, if, if uh, a family has young children and wants to get involved in this, would you advise not uh, uh, having a teenager in the home? Or what, what kind of guidelines have you created at this point? We don't have specific guidelines, and I have seen all different kinds of situations work. It really just depends on the family. And I hate to keep saying that, but it yeah. really does. Um, some good friends of ours in Prince William County adopted uh, children right after they got married and had a couple of birth kids. They're perfectly happy and lovely family and um, one of the happiest families I know. Uh, other people will tell you, you really should, because of birth order considerations, you really should foster or adopt a child that's younger than your youngest child. So they're I, but I've seen all kinds of situations work. I would just say, um, you know, open your heart, go get trained, um, educate yourself on the issue, educate yourself on trauma-informed care, and, and, and see what happens. I mean, the, the, the thing is, we, we serve a God who's the creator of the universe and who is sovereign, so ideally, or, or theoretically, he, he's the one that's going to be um, having something to say about the kid that gets placed in your home. All right. Other questions? Any of you? Oh, more people. Yeah, I, I had a quick question. Um, has, okay, is it technically an organization, like what you work for? America's um, Kids Belong, we are a 501c3, yes. Okay, um, have you ever considered collaborating with any other organizations? Like for example, like one really good one I have in mind is uh, Show Hope. It was founded by Stephen Curtis Chapman, and it has an international reach, but can, that, that includes domestic. Here, so basically, like, what are your thoughts on that? And also, what um, Dr. Orlovsky mentioned about um, macro, I, um, like that term is that working with small organizations like that. Like, I mean, is that something over, that you're already doing, or you're thinking about maybe instituting, like, furthering your reach? And are you strictly domestic, or you know, thinking about branching into foreign, or trying to take care of the domestic part first? Oh, good question. Sorry, this was going to be a really short question. Yeah, that's and okay. I just added like 20 parts to that's it. That's okay. Yeah. So uh, if I don't remember one of them, remind me. Um, we absolutely work with other organizations in every state that we're in. Um, Project 111 in Tulsa was the, uh, the reason why we were successful in Oklahoma. They had laid the groundwork for two years before we came in. We work with Show Hub, We work with the Forgotten Initiative. We work with Sandra Stanley. We work with basically anyone who will work with us. And we really try to have, because we're coming in as outsiders into a state. So we really try to have humility when we come in and say, you can do it. We can help. We've built this car in other states. So... Um, you know, we can tell you how to put it together and it'll take you less time because we've done it before. Um, but you don't have to listen to us. And uh, you really should have these people that are here on the ground who are doing good work building the car with you because they know what they're doing too. And so, yes, we work with other organizations. We do focus on ending the orphan crisis in the United States, not uh, internationally, although we have had some inquiries from other nations. We really feel like we're called to end the orphan crisis in the United States. Um, by 2025, which we only have eight years left, so it's a little scary. Um, the reason for that, it, tell me your name. Zachary. Zachary. The reason for that is that if you go internationally, if you've ever traveled to an orphanage um, and you talk to the leaders in the orphanage and they'll, they'll say, oh, you know, where, where are all these kids' parents? Did they die? And the perception is they have no parents. But those children in those orphanages, for the same reason that our children are in foster care, we just call it foster care. They're in prison, they've lost their job, they're down on the luck, they're addicted. And um, so while we don't call them orphanages, um, while we don't, it's not kosher in the United States to call them even orphans, although biblically that's what they are, um, we, uh, that, that's really, that's our calling. There are some great organizations. We love fostering and adopting everywhere and support that, but our scope is the foster care system in the United States. Thank you. Now, this is a state issue, and as you've mentioned, it varies a lot from state to state. Uh, nationally, the one development, and 
years ago was setting up an adoption tax credit. Uh, anything further developing on those lines? Or, and uh, Richmond isn't all that far away from Washington. Have you had any contact with anyone in the Trump administration, or is there someone there who seems particularly interested in this question now? Um, the adoption tax credit is a wonderful thing. Our adoption expenses were about fifteen thousand. We're getting ten thousand of that back, which is um, so. Anything that we can do to keep that, I obviously would encourage every um, member of Congress to to keep. Um, there is a wonderful organization called the Congressional Caucus on Adoption Institute, CCAI, and they lobby on this issue uh, in Congress and um, just do great work. Um, th they will probably be our avenue on the federal level, uh, although we have relationships in, in the federal government. It's a state issue. We are waiting to see who he houses in his faith-based initiatives office. Um, Right. before we proceed with the Trump administration. I'm smiling a little bit because uh, on Friday afternoon, I was interviewing Michael Ware here, who worked Oh, I Obama. love Michael! So, oh, he's, oh yeah, he's that's a very, great. He's a very oh, you guys boy. should come to that. He's amazing. So, well, that, we just, we had that on this past Friday. Oh, this past this Friday? Past Friday. Oh, and he's I a missed very, it. He's a very lovable guy. He's a very uh, lovable guy. And he was smiling Democrat. about the, because the, the, the faith-based office right now, at this point, there's no one there. There's no one there. And so, okay, there's so no you're, waiting, you're waiting on that. Uh, Trent yeah. Franks. Cue the Jeopardy thing. Uh, Congressman Franks yes. from Arizona. Of course. Interviewed him and he's, he's, I know, very interested. He, he's one of the people. The Adoption the, Caucus. The Adoption Caucus. Yes. Who, who else, name, particular people we should be watching in, in Congress who are involved in this? Oh, man. I have almost exclusively focused on state stuff. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure. I know uh, Ben Sass is always my favorite member of Congress these days, so he will be one of the first people that I go to. Okay. Um, Senator Kane from Virginia, uh, his wife, this was her issue when he was governor. Um, and uh, so I don't know that he's incredibly active on this, but if you go to CCAI's website, they list all of their members of Congress who are on their board and who are active. Okay. Let's see, we are just about out of time, but we have one more question. Uh, it seems like if you're a proponent of adoption, sometimes that's pitted against family reunification. Mm. And how do you see those two things? Man, that's a great question. And really the core, that's a great question to end on. Um, and I, I said this a little bit earlier, but I'd love to extrapolate that out. Um, you know, the adoption brand is great. The foster care brand, not so great. Um, and one of our desires is to really treat foster families as the heroes that they are, um, you know, military discounts at restaurants and things like that. I would, I would love to see that happen. But yeah, reunification is the goal of foster care. Um, that is plan A. In the church, sometimes we get that confused. We think that adoption is plan A, but no, reunification is. And that science, um, and I would say things of scripture would back that up. Uh, it's absolutely best if children are in a stable, loving birth family. No questions asked. Go look it up. Go find it. It, it just is. Um, emphasis on stable and loving, though. And, and you, that's why we need the church to also wrap around those birth families, not just the foster families. So if, that, if, if the birth parents are not willing to do what they need to do to get that child back, then absolutely, plan B is a very, very quick, hopefully, adoption timeline. Um, we had kids in Virginia that had been waiting to be adopted for 16 years. Uh, which is unconscionable and immoral and unjust, in, in my opinion. And so, and they're like that in every state. I'm not picking on Virginia. There are kids like that in every state. And there's no, there was no reason why. I mean, they, they weren't, you know, sexual predators or extremely violent or anything like that. These were normal kids who just, um, they just hadn't been given that, uh, that opportunity. And we were able to find those children families in, in the McDonald administration. Highlight of my professional life, to be honest with you. Um, and so, quick turnaround on adoption, I think that our, our judges also need to be educated on, um, on trauma so that they can get kids through the system more quickly. Um, but uh, scriptures and science back up reunification as plan A and adoption as plan B, and um, really wrapping around both, both of those uh, paths. Uh, there's something right now that's called concurrent planning, which you may be familiar with, that um, if it looks like the child, because it, it takes two years to get an adoption finalized on average in, in the foster care system. Once it's, um, there's a suspicion that the child's not going to be reunified, you know, uh, the social workers will go ahead and start looking for a family um, for, uh, for that child, which has really cut down the wait times and, and been good. But again, um, the greatest need to solve this problem is greater 
quality foster families who have the right motives and are able to love children unconditionally. Good. Well, this will be very valuable for Thanks. leaders of world. So please join me in thanking Janet for coming. Thank you.